Well, praise the Lord, friends. This is Pastor Kevin O'Connor, and I wanted to welcome you to the immutable truth. Today, I want to discuss for uh, just a few minutes what uh, has been transpiring over the last few days. I, I put out a video two days ago while I was on my morning walk exhorting uh, somewhat firmly the church not to be conformed to the world, to stop trying to win lost people with, with worldly means and by enticing them with worldly uh, desires or trying to change the gospel to make it fit what they would like. So today I want to address this in a little more uh, detail, uh, a little more biblically, and a little more thoroughly, because there are some who read my posts, saw the video, and for whatever reason feel as if I was being too harsh, uh, I was being unloving, or that I somehow uh, don't love people, okay? Okay. The reality is I very seldom put out a video that just uh, challenges people in that fashion, okay? I normally put out videos or sermons that are encouraging and uplifting, maybe challenging to a point, but two days ago I was really have been in prayer for a month now almost, and I see such a... Uh, 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 influence of the world in the church as a pastor, as an elder, it is my job. I'm charged by scripture to say something. So today I want to talk about this in a bit more detail. I want to give you a little bit more of an answer for why I said what I said, the reasoning behind it and my heart behind it, because the heart with which I was saying it, was out of love, first of all, for God's people who should not be conformed to this world, but should be transformed by the renewing of their mind and not live as unbelievers or those of the world. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. And we have, uh, uh, we have got to get back to that mentality where Christianity is not this loosely thrown together thing that I can just do whatever I want with, what I believe, how I live, how I act should be uh, 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 established by the word of God, not by culture, not dictated by unbelievers. Uh, so what if unbelievers don't like the songs at your church? Uh, to, to change them to songs that they would like uh, it, it is is irrelevant. The church, the meeting together of believers is for the believers and for worshiping God whom we believe in. So it should not be dictated by those who live outside of Christ, outside of the church, okay? We must and always submit ourselves to the word of God and to the authority of God's word. Now, uh, secondly, so many people uh, challenged me as to why it was my place to say anything and why I should, uh, why, why am I being so mean and hateful and why, oh, you know, uh, uh, you, we're supposed to love each other and we're supposed to, we're supposed to pray for one another. Let the Holy Spirit deal with that person, okay? Let the Holy Spirit convict of sin, okay? Let's talk about this just for a minute, and then we're going to get into some biblical understanding of all that. First of all, the, the Bible does say that the Holy Spirit will come and convict of sin and of righteousness. But as far as the church goes, God appointed elders through Paul and told these elders, pastors, to rebuke, repute, reprove, correct, to train, to warn, okay? And these men are charged with doing that. 
Why? Because he doesn't say if you see your brother caught in a fault, pray for him that the Holy Spirit would convict him. He does not say that. What he says, if you, you see your brother caught in a fault, go to him. Okay? And they'll go, well, why didn't you go to some of the people you were talking about on that post? Here's the thing. So many different churches are doing what I was talking about, and they're doing it openly and blatantly, that I don't have to hide my context of why I'm saying what I'm saying. I will say what I'm saying openly for all to hear so that they can see scripturally I am trying to get people to come back to an understanding of stop uh, of uh, of them not trying to live for the world or to please men but to please Christ and to live their life for Christ. We can't live in such a way that the world dictates to us how we worship, what it looks like, what it sounds like, and if you're doing that, you're not following scripture, okay? Those songs are, uh, we as people are not the, the audience of praise and worship. God is the audience. We are singing to him. Therefore, the songs we sing must be pleasing to God, not to me, not to my flesh even. The, uh, the idea that worship is, has to please me is foreign to scripture, okay? Worship is to please God and to honor God, to uplift the name of Jesus. So let's talk about this just for a minute. I'm sorry, those of you that's listening on the podcast, I just hit the microphone. I want to talk about this just a little bit more in detail. I'm going to put my glasses on. I look like Santa Claus, so just uh, bear with me, okay? Let's start, if you will, in John, 1 John, excuse me, 1 John chapter 2. We're going we're gonna to see here John's own words, and I want you to take them how you want. You, you got your own Bible, get your Bible out and read along with me. John chapter 2, starting at verse 14. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, I'm going to stop right here because the often quoted verse that, that is brought up is, Well, God loved the world, didn't he? Not in the context of what we're talking about here. God does love the world in that he created the world. He created mankind and has a plan of redemption for mankind. But God does not love the sin of the world. God does not love the passions and the lusts and the desires of this world. God does not love those things. And we are not to love those things. So when it says you're not to love the world or the things of the world, he is talking about the lusts and the desires of the world. How do I know that? Keep reading your Bible. He says, do not love the world, verse 15, excuse me, not 14, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eye and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. These verses are illuminating to us that we must not adopt the world standard or love the things of the world or be drawn or moved by the passions of this world. Now, my study Bible says this, the moral uh, admonition to not love the world is also practical advice, for it is already clear that the world is passing away, verse 17. As in John's gospel, the world is the system of rebellion and pride that seeks to displace God and his rule. It is this system rather than the created order itself that is not from the Father, and that has already been marked for judgment and destruction. Those who are not of the world receive the revelation 
of the Father from Jesus and show by their response to it that they have been chosen for salvation and eternal life. In other words, I can't live like the world if I truly follow Christ. So for me to get on a video and, and tell the church, hey church, stop trying to live like the world. Stop trying to win the world with worldly things and worldly passions and lure them in with worldly lust. It's not anti-Christ. It is, it is absolutely fundamentally what Christ taught. It's fundamentally what the disciples taught. It's fundamentally what the Bible teaches that we need to be in the world, but not of the world. We are to also we are to, to love all men and try to reach them, but we are not to become those people to try to reach them. I don't care uh, your 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 uh, any kind of people pleasing to model your church that in such a way that you change the gospel or the message or or. Or uh, the way you would do it just to please men is not biblical. Let's keep reading because I don't want to stop right there. Go to Romans 12 and 2. We'll, we'll start at verse 1. Okay, Romans 12 verse 1. As soon as I get there, he says this. Paul writing to the Roman church, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed, but be, tr do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may test that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We need to understand that God has a plan. God has a way that he wants his church to behave. He, wants, he, he has a way in which he expects worship to happen. And it's not to be done to please men. It's not to be done to, to, to try to lure people in with carnal desires or carnal lusts. It's not meant for that. Now, I want to read another portion of this study Bible. It says this, Do not be conformed. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Formerly, Christians were futile in their thinking. But now, the Christian's mindset is to be determined and reshaped by the knowledge of the gospel. By the power of the Spirit and the concerns of the age to come, rather than by the passing fashions of this age. Only by such uh, sanctifying renewal is the Christian made sufficiently sensitive to discern the behavior that God's revealed will requires in each situation. Now, the realities of what I just read are profound. We are not to be conformed by the, 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 the fashions or the trends of this world. We're not to conform the gospel or conform our worship to the trends or the fashions of this world, but we are to submit ourselves to the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and understand that God has a way that Christian behavior, Christian worship is to take place and if we don't take this seriously, we run the risk of being conformed to the world and looking like the world and sounding like the world and becoming worldly. We don't want that. That is not Christian life. That is not the plan that God has for us. We are to conform uh, we are to be conformed in our mind and transformed and uh, reshaped into the image of him who loved us and gave himself for us. We're not to be transformed into the image of the things that are around us because we were already those things. Formerly, we've been delivered from that. Don't be conformed. This note in this study Bible where it says that we are to be transformed by the gospel, the power of the spirit, and the concerns of the age to come. 
and not the passing fashions of this age. Meaning I'm looking towards heaven. Jesus said, I'll go to prepare a place for you. I'm, I'm not living my life only for right here and right now and this life. I'm living my life for a future life, a life that I'm going to be with God, with Christ, in glory, in eternity. That's what I'm living my life for. I want to go to 2 Corinthians, and you'll have a hard time with this because you'll say, well, pastor, how does this how does this coincide with everything you just read? And if you'll just give me a few more minutes, I'll explain it to you, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 14. He says this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as he had said, I will make my dwelling place among them and walk among them. I will, I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. Be separated from them, says the Lord. Do not touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be your father, and you shall be my sons and my daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and the spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Now, I'm going to read another note here. And the part I want you to focus on is what fellowship do believers have with unbelievers, okay? The reality is when I am made brand new, the, the really the only link to me and unbelievers is this. We're all sinners. We're all, we were all like them, dead in our trespasses and sins. This is the thing that connects us is the fact that we are all in need of Christ. That's the only thing. I'm not to be like them. I'm not to portray myself like them. I'm not to behave like them at all. Okay? I'm to separate myself and not be like them. Okay? I want to read this note. Note that the false apostles in Corinth claimed to be Christians but were really, in reality, servants of Satan. To join with them would distort all life and ministry in the church. The prohibition against being yoked together with unbelievers must be considered in situations where significant control over one's actions would be yielding to an unbeliever through a voluntary partnership or association. Neither Paul nor the New Testament tells us not to associate at all with unbelievers. But we are told not to be yoked together with them in such a way that they significantly influence the direction or the outcome of our moral decisions and spiritual activities. Now, that's where I wanted to lean on this verse. We are not to allow the world. Now, we're supposed to go out into all the world and preach the gospel, tell of God's good grace and love that he has loved all men with and and that the good news is Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the price for their sins. If they would believe in him, they would be saved. Yes, that is the message, but my message the other day was not to lost people, but to Christians who are trying to allow unbelievers to dictate spiritual activities. They're allowing partnership with unbelievers or the, the ability to try to reach unbelievers dictate uh, 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 how we make decisions or our spiritual activity, which is totally against scripture. Uh, you can argue all you want with me about how you feel. You can argue all you want with me about uh, it doesn't sound nice and we need to be... Look, Paul was absolutely uh, 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 
persecuted for the things that he said. And these are his words, not mine. These are Paul's words saying, we're not to do this. We're to be separate. We're not to live like them. We're not to look like them. Okay? We can't accept just because it doesn't feel nice to tell somebody no, or it doesn't feel nice to tell somebody the truth, that somehow by telling them the truth, I'm being unloving. Love does not rejoice in lies. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Love rejoices in the truth. And love will tell the truth in love, but it will always tell the truth. Friends, my heart in my message just a few days ago was not to be some domineering, dictating, screaming preacher. It was to, it was to wake up the hearts and the minds of people in the church who are making concerted, conscious efforts to try to please people rather than Christ. That was my point. That was the intent of my message. And I will not back down from it. I will not take it back. I didn't, I, I, I was being very forthright in my conversation just as I am right now. Now, uh, there's a lot of people, they don't like it when preachers get excited, but you also understand that I was walking three miles while I was talking on my phone, and I'm not making excuses. I'm telling you, I'm a fiery preacher, okay, and I get to holler, and I get excited about the things of God. I get excited when, when, when I'm delivering uh, a message, and I make no apologies for that, okay? The realities of what I said are absolutely true. And even those who talk to me that, that uh, disagreed with me concede to the fact that they believe most of everything I said in that video. They might not like how I delivered it. They might not like the fact that I said it because it makes you uncomfortable. But the reality is what I said was true. Okay, and we're we're going through it right now. We cannot be conformed to this world. We can't love this world or the things of the world. We must not be unequally yoked to the world in such a way that they dictate, that unbelievers dictate how we worship or what decisions we make as we worship God. That's ludicrous. It's unbelievable that we would do that. Christ, the word of God is our authority for life and godliness, how we live our life, how we worship, it's the word of God, not the opinions of men. Matthew 6, 19 through 24, I'm not going to go there. Uh, I will tell you, well, maybe I will. Let's just go there. That way you guys know that I'm not trying to pull no wool over your eyes. Matthew 6, 24. Well, let's start at verse 19, okay? Verse 19, Matthew 6, verse 19, he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, you're like, well, pastor, how does this equate to what you're talking about? This goes along with not being being unequally yoked with the world, not loving the world. I can't love the world and love Christ. I can't love money or the things of this world and love Christ. I cannot. Jesus, uh, first of all, makes mention that we're supposed to be storing up treasure in heaven because our, our focus, our goal is eternal, not for this life. Our goal, our focus is for the life to come, not this life right now. Jesus is saying this explicitly. And then he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if the eye is healthy, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, well, you know, we, we, we heard the, the other parable of Christ that a little bit of leaven spoils the whole bunch. What he's saying is 
You have to be single-minded. You have to have one focus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You have, as a Christian, your focus must be Christ, His will, His kingdom, His desires for you, and no one else's. This is not some newfangled teaching. This is absolutely biblical, historic Christianity, okay? We, I, I am, I did not get on there uh, two days ago and just rant and rave about things I did not have any idea about. I got on there because I see an absolute need for somebody to stand up and say enough is enough, okay? Let's finish this up because, uh, uh, we the the next question I got was well why are you why are you saying something who who qualifies you take the speck out of your own eye okay you you better get get on there and take the speck out of your own eye before you go and talk to your brother okay let's do that okay the reality of what Jesus said he didn't say don't judge anyone don't help your brother he said help yourself first okay now, in the last six months at our church we've been trying our level best to get back to absolute biblical Christianity, following it, uh, following the word of God and nothing else, not the opinions of my denomination, not the opinions of other preachers, not the opinions of other men, but what the word of God itself says, okay? This is where I'm coming from. Not a heart of, oh my goodness, you guys don't got it and I got it. I, I don't have it. What I'm telling you is the Word of God says one thing and we're doing something else. And it's not the Word of God that has to change. It's us. Okay? We must decrease. He must increase. Okay? So why would I say something? Why would... I be able to say something, okay? Let's let's go to Ephesians. I want to just give you a few verses here, and then I'll then I'll go into a little more detail about what I'm talking about, okay? And we all love this verse because we all we all want to be one of these. And oh man, oh yeah, God gave us these things. I want to read this to you. Ephesians chapter four, starting at verse eleven. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wave and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunningness, and craftiness in deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now I want you to notice the next part of this. Now, this I say and testify in the Lord that you may no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, to greed, to practice every kind of impurity. But it is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus Christ, to put off your old self, which, is, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through the deceitful desires and is to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put off falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor. Do not uh, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as it fits the occasion 
that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now this shows us the purpose of why God gave us apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. Okay, the understanding here is that pastors are here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that they would grow up. Okay, so my job as a pastor is equipping and you'll go, well, you know, Kevin, it didn't say anything in there about, you know, reproving or rebuking or correcting you talking about love. Well, we've already talked about love, okay? Love does not mean I lie to people. Love does not mean I hide the truth about God's expectations from people. I, I, why would I just, uh, oh, we, we want you to come just as you are. Well, we do, but we also need to set an expectation. Look, if you're coming to Christ, it is a free gift, but it's going to change you. It's going to make you new. It's going to make you different. It's going to set you apart, Okay, and you're not going to live like you used to live. You're not going to act like you used to act. You're not going to live like the world lives. You're not going to talk like the world talks. Amen. We're not even going to sing like the world sings. Amen. It cannot be both. We can't serve God and serve the world. We can't serve Christ and the opinions of men. That is not biblical. Let's finish this up. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I flew past it, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse, let's start at verse 1, chapter 2, verse, uh, chapter, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God. Who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season to rebuke, uh, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers who suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths as you uh, as for you always be sober-minded endure suffering do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry this is paul speaking to timothy the pastor of ephesus i had Someone talked to me about, well, you know, Paul rebuked people, but Paul was an apostle. So that's kind of for, for apostles. And no, no, rebuking was not only for apostles, okay? Rebuking is charged by Paul to the pastors, to the elders of the church, that they are not. And if you go back and read 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, don't let anybody teach these myths and endless genealogies and all these fables. Don't let them teach that stuff, but only let them teach what is right, what is good. So how would he do, how, how would he not let them teach them things if he doesn't bring out first correction to say, no, this is wrong. We should not be doing this. You know, Paul went and rebuked Peter to his face openly in front of all the people there. Why did he do it in front of all people? So that as he done this, all who saw it would know that Paul was standing on the scripture, on the gospel, on what Jesus did, that we are not to be saved by the works of our hands, but by the grace of God, not by circumcision, but the circumcision of the heart. He approached Peter so that all who saw it would know the conversation, that nothing was hidden, that we're not trying to hide this conversation like, oh, the church is perfect. The church doesn't have to be perfect because Christ is perfect. Do you understand? We're not perfect, okay? And to pretend like we can't or shouldn't have these discussions openly where, where we can have open dialogue about these conflicts and the things that are going on is, is just to add to the hypocrisy that the world already sees in the church because we'll say one thing to them and try to portray or paint a narrative like we're perfect, 
but then they'll see, you know, behind closed doors, oh, we're fighting and all, all this. So why don't we just come out and be honest? Christ is perfect. We are not. And let us get back to the biblical understanding of what it is to be led by Christ, to worship Christ, and not be drawn in by the world's devices to try to think that we have to change the gospel or change our approach just to meet uh, some kind of desire that's in lost and dying people. It's not right. It's not the gospels. We're not told to do that. We're absolutely told not to do that. Okay? And for, for people to get on my Facebook and just start calling me out like I don't know what I'm talking about, like the Bible doesn't say what it's saying, that, that you know, I'm just, I was thinking in my mind, if Paul was here, they may very well have just started ostracizing Paul at the same time because Paul's the one, I, everything that I've read to you outside of the very first verse and and Matthew were Paul's words. John agreed with Paul, don't love the world or the things of this world. They're passing away. They're not, that, that's not the things we're supposed to be running after anyway. Amen. Let's go to one more verse, and then I'm going to close. Titus, chapter 2. If you don't know where Titus is, it's right after 2 Timothy. Titus, chapter 2, verse 4. Or chapter, Titus, chapter uh, 2, verse 11. Excuse me. Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of for his own possession who are zealous for good works declare these things exhort rebuke with all authority let no one dis, uh, disregard you let no one disregard you now this is Paul writing to Titus the pastor in, of the church of Crete he's he's telling he's telling Titus, look, the gospel has appeared unto all men and is here uh, to save, but it's here also to teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly pleasures, worldly passions, but to live upright, godly lives in this present age. And, and then he says, exhort these things and rebuke people who are not doing these things. And he said, do it with all authority. He said, don't let anyone disregard you. These are pretty strong statements that Paul is making to Titus. This is, this is very emphatic wording that Paul is giving to Titus, saying, Hey, Titus, I want you to be serious about these things. These things are important. It's important that we don't follow the pattern of this world. These are all Paul's words, and he's agreeing with himself in Romans, Don't be conformed to this world. In Corinthians, don't be unequally yoked. In Ephesians, the fivefold ministry was given to, to, to uh, uh, train the church, to teach the church, to equip the church, and that we are supposed to be about doing that, speaking the truth in love and not about fleshly desires or former things and not to run as unbelievers or Gentiles. He says the same thing in for, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, where we're to preach the word. Yeah, this charge I give to you before God and our Lord Jesus Christ, be ready to reprove, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all patience and doctrine or teaching. And Titus, we're told to exhort and to rebuke and to do it with all authority. Okay? This is a charge to the elder of that church. He gives the same charge to the elder of, uh, of Ephesus in Timothy. He gives the same charge to the Corinthian church. He gives the same charge to the Romans. Don't be conformed to this world. Stop trying to live like the world. This is not what we're supposed to do. And I'm sure those elders in that church in Rome and the elders in the church in Corinth, they reproved and rebuked and corrected those who were trying to live this way. 
So when you ask me, why do I, what, what gives you the right? It's not about me. I don't have authority in and of my own goodness to rebuke anybody. I have the right, the responsibility, the charge in scripture to say something. I'm the watchman on the wall that is crying out saying, look, the sword is coming and you're in the way. Amen. We've got to understand that while I was being very passionate in my delivery, while I was being very zealous in my uh, 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 rebuke or my uh, uh, correction, it wasn't done out of a sense of superiority because I am the least among any preacher in the town that I live in. But I also see a great need that some pastor needs to stand up and say, this is enough. We need to get back to living our life for Christ and stop trying to to, to mold the church into the uh, into a mold that's going to be palatable by the world or that the world's going to like because they're not going to like you. I posted an article where uh, where an unsaved person was saying when when Christians start to act like me, it makes me wonder why I should even act like them because they're trying to be like me. The reality that we try to reach people by being like them is is ridiculous. It's ludicrous. It's not scriptural. So, friends, I want to close with this. The heart with which I posted the video that I posted two days ago was out of love and concern for Christ's church, for believers who are wandering into things that don't glorify God. They're wandering into letting the world dictate how they live, how they worship, how we have church. That is ridiculous. It's nonsensical. It's not biblical. It is absolutely what we're told not to do in Scripture. So when I said it, I said it in love. I said it out of a concern for those Christians who would be portraying a false narrative, a false Christ, a false gospel, because we are told in, uh, 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 oh goodness, Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 it, or 8, if I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel other than the gospel that has been presented to you, let him be accursed, anathema, bound to hell forever. So friends, my concern was the church's well-being, believers' well-being, the gospel being preserved, the gospel being the forefront, the main thing. If you go through all of Paul's letters, what you get is the gospel of Jesus Christ is the main message. If it ain't Jesus Christ and him crucified, it's not the gospel. If it isn't Jesus Christ, it, the object of your worship, if Jesus Christ isn't informing your decisions about how to worship or how to have church or why you go to church, you are missing the gospel. The gospel is very clear. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. And Christ saved us, translated us from darkness to light. He saved us, made us alive when we were dead. He forgave our sins. He was crucified, died, and rose again to justify us before the Father. And as we believe in him and he redeems us, our life is over living it for ourselves. It is no longer my will, but God's will that should be done. It's no longer my kingdom or my opinion or my life that matters, but the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the principle. This is the heart behind the message that I put on Facebook while I was on my morning walk. So I wanted to get on here and I wanted to give you guys some clarification. I wanted to go through this biblically. I wanted to go through this thoroughly so you understood my heart in delivering the message. So there was no confusion as, oh, pastor just hates everybody, hates uh, modern worship. There's, there is a lot of modern worship songs. We still sing at our church, okay? I am not out here bashing worship styles. I'm not out here uh, uh, bashing certain churches. I didn't even call anybody out. But the reality is we should be singing biblically, theologically correct songs. We should be singing songs that glorify God and not man. We should be 
singing songs, not because they please us, but because they please God. That is the way worship should be happening. That should be the 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 reason for our worship that you know, if we're just coming to church just for the worship music, we're coming for the wrong reasons. We should be coming and gathering together because we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love the fellowship of the saints. We love coming together and praying and worshiping and hearing the word of God ministered. Those are the things that should be driving, driving our willingness to be involved with God's church, the act of redemption that Jesus saved me, that he redeemed me, and he made me a part of this body, he, a part of this body that he calls his church. That's the reasoning for it. And I wanted you to know it. I want you to share this video, okay? I want you to share this Immutable Truth podcast. I did it on the church page so that everybody that's on the church page could hear it because that's where I posted the original video. I wanted to sh I want you to share it. I'm going to share this video. I'm going to share I'm going to upload the podcast to SoundCloud and all the other 25 different uh, uh, platforms that we're on and I want you to share it so everybody knows that what I was saying was not done in a heart of not loving people it was absolutely done because my heart cries out for God's church for Christ's people to stop trying to live like the world God bless you friends look forward to seeing you again share the post and remember love God and love people